Yeah, so I just want to do, just to revert to that, you know, Vixellian uh, discussion of inflation that we mentioned uh, uh, previously. So what I'd like to try to do, actually, uh, from from beginning, is I'd like to try to draw all these different um, threads together now. So I've called this economic growth, trade, public finance, and the paradox of thrift. So what I think we can do now is we can generate two alternative theories of economic growth. That is to say, we're going to develop two generic growth equations, each of which will include the trade balance, the primary budget deficit as a percentage of GDP, and the domestic investment savings balance. Um, the first one is going to be what I call a Keynes-type theory. This will validate such controversial issues that fiscal expansion leads to growth, it will um, validate the idea that investment drives savings, not the other way around, the paradox of thrift. Um, also, it will validate the idea, if we're thinking about the case of China then, that a trade surplus leads to growth, uh, um, uh, which I call, um, this is my term for it, monetary mercantilism. Uh, then we can also identify a classics type theory which uh, does have advocates uh, amongst our group here. I would suggest that that yields anomalous results and uh, does not provide a solid uh, foundation for the classical theories of trade, savings, or public finance. So real value added um, or real GDP is just given by our usual uh, GDP equals consumption spending, investment spending, government spending, plus net exports. And obviously throughout this course anyway, we've been primarily interested in the growth rate of the expression that is lowercase y, um, which is simply the growth rate of real GDP. Now, how can we derive the Keynes type growth theory? This is the one that brings in the paradox of thrift and all of that kind of thing. Well, actually, um, it can be derived uh, by adding a lagged consumption function. This is just, in a way, a very straightforward Keynesian consumption function. Um, but it was Hicks' idea uh, that um, it should depend on lagged income rather than current income. And so if I do that, um, you know, C0 is the intercept term in the consumption function, autonomous spending, if you will. C sub 1 is the marginal propensity to consume out of lagged disposable income. And obviously, um, Y lagged minus T lagged is uh, disposable income of the previous period. So, so all that's really being suggested, we're not here w worrying about whether investment equals savings or you know, that kind of issue. We're saying that the people base their consumption decisions on the income that they had last period, which is uh, again, a, a, a behavioral hypothesis. We have to, um, at this point, make a distinction between what um, the post-Keynesians, and there are great debates amongst post-Keynesians, Kaletskians, um, Mark Lava, who we've mentioned today, has been a primary contributor to this literature, about the difference between what is called capacity creating and non-capacity creating autonomous expenditure. We then divide through by lagged output. Um, we're going to define, as we've done already, uh, lowercase g uh, to be equal to um, g over y, lowercase x is x over y, and so forth. Recall that y is growth. We can you know, work through the different um, expressions, take logs. And we end up with the Keynes-type growth equation. And what does equation eight say? Equation eight says that growth occurs when, firstly, total autonomous spending as a percentage of GDP is greater than the marginal propensity to save. Because we're not questioning that investment equals savings here, you know, like ex, ex post. This is the total autonomous spending as a percentage of GDP 
and it has to be greater than the marginal propensity to save. If so, there will be growth. Growth occurs if there's a primary budget deficit as a percentage of GDP. Growth occurs um, if there's a trade surplus as a percentage of GDP, hence monetary mercantilism. You know, they don't all have to occur together, obviously. You know, one can be going in one direction. <laughs> you know, one can be going in another direction. Um, but um, but uh, uh, that's where the, uh, that's the Keynesian growth equation. As Frederick has kept stressing, this is the kind of thing that makes sense um, in terms of the real political economy of the real world. I mean, in, in, in the theory of free trade, we're told that we should aim for what? Trade balance, I suppose. In the real world, the mercantilist player du jour, if China is the mercantilist player du jour, has rapid growth. I mean, everyone knows instinctively that, um, you know, if we're in a recession, we unbalance the budget. I mean, the government of Canada, the government of Canada um, uh, has done specifically that and got through the recession. Um, again, um, neoclassical economics would not allow that <laughs> to occur. Um, and this, is, this is the sense in which um, total spending, autonomous spending, leads saving. And yet at the same time, we can maintain the investment savings uh, identity. I think it is useful to reconcile that Keynesian growth equation and uh, the sectoral balances, typical sectoral balances equation. What the growth equation says is that the total autonomous spending of uh, GDP, if that is greater than the marginal propensity to save, that will lead to growth. In short, equations 10 and 11 are consistent with one another. Now, what about the classics type theory? Well, I, I hit on this way of um, deriving a generic classics type theory by going back to the Harrod-Domar growth formula from the 1940s, which in the notation I use, I just, may I just finish the, uh, yeah. In the notation I use lowercase, uh, um, lowercase y is the growth rate, s is the average propensity to save, and I'm going to be using the symbol O to stand for capital output ratio. In the actual Harrod equation, I, I forget what it was. It was S over C or something like that. But, but uh, anyway, you were going to have a question. Then. About the Keynesian model, uh, the investment was uh, all autonomous, wasn't it? As the exports, for instance. Yes. Yes. So uh, what happened to the rate of capacity utilization, the model, if uh, the investment and the export grows at different ra uh, ratios? How yeah. you can correct it? Well, actually, that issue comes in in this Harrod Domar model. Oh, there, there's a actually on the website of of the um, on the website of this uh, of the Fields Institute is that exchange between Mark and um, Mark Lavoie and Peter Scott. Yeah, which deals exactly with these issues. And so, yeah. So I mean, uh, I do recommend having a look at that. Um, now, Harrod, of course, thought that this was a contribution to Keynesian economics, arguing precisely on these grounds of capacity utilization that um, uh, the equation is an unstable equilibrium, the famous knife edge. Okay? Um, however, if this appeal to a special case does not hold up, um, I would say the equation actually takes a big step backwards from Keynes into the world of classical economics, capital theory, and indeed into worlds where we worry about you know, capacity utilization. Because if you push all of that to one side and just look at what the equation says, what does the equation actually say? On the face of it, equation 12 actually says that um, uh, when uh, the savings propensity increases, growth increases. The opposite to the Keynesian view about the paradox of thrift. Also, as we stressed all along, um, that uh, technical innovation will increase um, growth. Um, now, you see, uh, as a, as a, you see, you know, Harrod thought that he could make the thing unstable by the mechanisms to which I think you implicitly refer. Um, I'm saying that as soon as you write down this equation, 
you've kind of just stepped straight back into the classical world. And uh, um, uh, really, if you just look at this thing on its face, um, uh, you know, you're back to must be saving in order for there to be growth. So let's work out a classic types growth theory using exactly those uh, standard uh, capital theoretic uh, terms. And oddly enough, you come up with something like this. You don't come out with, you know, y equals s over o. In our lowercase notation, the classics type growth equation comes out like this. And as I say, it gives strange results, as far as I can say. You've still got the idea that an increase in savings uh, will increase growth, but you have here an idea that a budget surplus would lead to um, increase in growth. Um, now, it's not, I mean, it's not that you can't come up with an argument in, in favor of that. I mean, if saving is a good thing, why doesn't the government just save as well? Why don't we all save, in fact, and not have, uh, why don't we all save 100% and not have any economy at all? Because saving is a good thing, am I right? A, a trade deficit leads to growth. Well, I mean, Again, I, I've never really heard that before. What I usually hear from trade uh, theory is that, um, is that you know, growth should be balanced, basically. And everyone gains from trade, even if growth is, uh, is balanced. Again, I mean, you can take the Milton Friedman line and you can say he was talking in a day when uh, the Japanese automobile market was strong. And he said, the Japanese send us cars and we send them bits of paper with a picture of Lincoln or some president on them, isn't that a great deal? And yes, it is a great deal. <laughs> and I suppose that's the logic behind this. But, you know, you're not going to get that deal <laughs> in the real world, as a matter of fact. Um, so that, so that it's peculiar anomalous type results. Now, of course, as we all know, the conventional wisdom on economic policy does not usually argue for an actual budget surplus uh, just to avoid deficits. Um, uh, nor do they actively argue for a trade deficit. You know, they don't argue that we want to sort of, you know, rip off the, West, the rest of the world um, entirely. Rather, it's usually assumed effectively that uh, government spending as a percentage of GDP should equal the average tax rate, that there should be bu bu budget balance. It's just a good thing <laughs> in and of itself. And also that... Um, Exports equals imports. External balance, as the term goes, is also just a good thing. So, you see, what you usually happen is that you simply just say hey, that what we're aiming for, actually, is budget balance, and what we're aiming for is external balance, in which case those two final terms drop out, and all you're left with um, is the supposed natural rate of growth, which is just Harrod's growth rate, interpreted now in a classical way, um, obviously, we've introduced the average tax rate now, and if you think about it, this is the twist on the classical theory that was provided by the supply-side theorists um, in the 1970s. Effectively, no argument is offered as to why that seemingly perverse logic of budget surpluses and trade deficits should not apply. So I just want to leave that there. I don't know whether I'll fully go through uh, the, the final slide, but I just want to let you know of its existence, shall we say. The final, and I presume that eventually these things will all be posted somewhere um, on, on the in internet. We'll kind of make up final versions of this and it'll get posted somewhere on the internet so people can, you know, go through them at their leisure. Um, what I did here was simply um, talk about the alternative views of, uh, of um, inflation, one of which we've um, discussed already, the Vexelian theory. Um, obviously, there's the simple quantity theory of money. The um, Vexel uh, type um, theory does, as some people have mentioned, take more accounts of endogenous money, bank credit creation, and so forth, but they, um, that insight is combined with a strict adherence to the so-called natural rate of interest. In the AMM, it's a good deal more complicated. There are Vexelian elements, you know, there are Keynesian elements. Um, 
you know, the third type of thing is cost push or conflict inflation. And I've just gone through a simple cost push or conflict inflation derivation here. I think we, we, we've actually almost come to the time, so I'm going to leave it there. I mean, maybe people have some additional questions uh, to finish off with? Yeah. I, I have a general comment, uh, then yeah. going back to this yeah. uh, thread of uh, validation and, and, and methodology. Uh, so, so I like that you presented alternative views about yeah. all these different mm -hmm. things. Uh, but I think the alternative views should should still, uh, uh, y you know, you can't you can't just decide uh, uh, beforehand which of the alternative views to toss out. Yeah. So I like to propose the following thing: that, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, y you know, what what do you do before you go and test the model against uh, reality? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, logic is a somewhat powerful thing. If, if a mod model is logically inconsistent, then you toss it out. Mm -hmm. But that only takes you so far, because uh, logical inconsistencies can often be remedied by uh, change in assumptions and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Accounting is also important. Yeah. If, if the accountant is wrong, then you toss the model out. But also that can be remedied by defining yeah, new yeah. ways of, yeah. uh, of, of, of bookkeeping. Uh, so, so, so once you do those things, you're still going to be left with a variety of models. Uh, and notice that I'm not including in the criteria for eliminating models things like micro-foundations. I don't think that's a valid way. If the model is not micro-founded, then you should toss it out. Yeah. But conversely, I also don't think that if a model is micro-founded, then you should toss it out as well. So just keep them there. Okay. Now how you decide yeah. between models. So yeah. you're proposing this uh, abduction, uh, which yeah. I, th I think it's... It's clever and important. Always reminds me of X Files, but uh, but yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> not meant. To, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but 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 w so as far as I understand, what is this abduction? Well, it's it's just like doing detective uh, work, or you know, court. Yeah, uh, you, you're trying to decide on a court yeah. case uh, what side uh, uh, has more reasonable claim yeah. to what actually happened. So you don't know what actually happens. You can see a, a time series for interest rate, but so what? You know, there is one sample path that actually happened in the yeah. past, but there is all sorts yeah. of circumstances around it. So then you go and you look at the data yeah. more and more carefully. So you start out yeah. with a variety of models, and then you uh, toss out the yeah. ones that don't explain what actually happened. So that's looking at the past. And then now look, this works equally well for, for the future. You still don't know what's going to happen in the future. Oh, so yeah. you, you start yeah. out with a variety of models that explain what you're seeing. And then as you go forward, yeah. evidence will accumulate. And some of those models will disappear. And some of those models will gain more uh, uh, prominence. Yeah. OK, so what I just described is yeah. Bayesianism. It's Bayesian yeah. method going both for something that happened in the past, yes. because yeah. what happened in a courtroom, it's exactly yeah. a Bayesian discussion, yeah. and what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. And I, uh, someone mentioned Bayesian statistics yesterday, and I yeah. think that it's a perfectly uh, uh, ontologically valid way to yeah. deal with problems yeah. in social sciences. Yeah. So that's all yeah. my... No, point taken, and I'm actually glad for all of these uh, um, uh, responses that you've made, in, including yourself. I actually like your analogy of sifting evidence in the courtroom. But I do think that the criteria comes to the, down to once you've sifted all the evidence, sometimes there's only one possible explanation. You know, and, uh, that, you know, and, and that's essentially what I mean by, a, by abduction. And if that's the m method that you and I are both using, then I'm with that. Um, you know, this sort of statistical infer inference uh, looking at, you know, confidence intervals and that kind of thing doesn't seem to me to solve any uh, issue. It's not adequate detective work, if you put it like that. Um, I have to disagree with you on the micro foundations because one of the big issues that we've been talking about here is money, and the micro foundations literature is just utterly weak uh, on the. Uh, uh, on the um, issue of money. And indeed, it, it's not surprising because if your premise is a model of barter exchange, whenever you introduce mon money into those micro foundations model, money is always um, welfare um, uh, un unimproving. It's actually, it's the, the, the fictional area is the, is the theory of barter exchange. We, what we're studying is, if you like, capitalism. That's what we're studying. 
we're not studying generic methods of provisioning, right? And, and you know, in, in those optimization models, there's something missing of the essential features of capitalism. There's certainly essential features of capitalism missing from what I've yes. discussed. But it's, it's reality that's going to tell you that it's missing. Uh, yeah, well, we, we, I think we both end up being realists as opposed to idealists on one side <laughs> and materialists on the other side. So uh, at this point, I'll thank you all for the, uh, for the questions and discussions. <laughs> for, uh,